about Jupiter. I am not involved with Juno, but I will certainly, towards the end of my talk, uh, talk a little bit about Juno and how uh, our work ties together with the uh, Juno work. So I first like to start a little bit, why study Jupiter? Well, Jupiter, as, probably, as you probably all know, is the largest planet in our solar system. Uh, it's about 12 times larger than the Earth, 300 times more massive, uh, but its composition is very different. So it looks uh, very much like the Sun, as far as composition is concerned. We have about 85% of hydrogen and 15% uh, of helium just like the sun, but then there are all these so-called trace amounts of methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen sulfide, which on the sun are present in the form of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. Uh, but on Jupiter, depending on the temperature and pressures, uh, these species, these uh, elements are present in the form of the molecules I just mentioned. And they actually really provide the weather on Jupiter. So these clouds, just like water on Earth, are really interesting because uh, they will make the clouds, we will see them, we will see really the weather patterns on Jupiter by studying those trace elements. Well, you already see, of course, here we have just a still uh, images from the Hubble Space Telescope showing the planet rotating. But if you would look at the planet rotating, uh, these are Cassini uh, images. Uh, and here we sort of uh, have the red spot uh, at the center. And you can see that all these zones and belts, the, the white ones are the so-called zones, and the brown ones we call belts, they all move at different speeds. And up here we show the wind pattern. And so there are some really very strong winds up to about 100 meters per second or 100 miles per hour. Uh, and uh, those uh, are in particular strong near the equatorial region. But in addition to the uh, horizontal uh, winds, we also have vertical motions. And these vertical motions, you get gas rising up, in particular in these zones, these white regions. And when the gas is rising up, it will cool down because the temperature is decreasing with altitude, just like here on Earth, where you climb a mountain, the temperature will decrease. So as soon as the temperature hits the condensation temperature of some gas, like water, or ammonia, then that gas will condense out and form a cloud in the atmosphere. So on Jupiter, we find the following cloud layer. So this orange line is the temperature pressure profile. So from deep down, you rise up, the temperature is decreasing, and one of the first clouds that will form is a water cloud. And when you go higher up, it gets colder, we start to form what we call a ammonium hydrosulfide cloud, NH4SH, which is ammonia plus hydrogen sulfide. And then the top cloud is ammonia ice. So we get these three clouds, we think, because that is what we expect based upon the composition in Jupiter as we think it is there. So the, the gases are rising up in these zones, and then the con condense, uh, condensation, the uh, gases will basically condense out, these, these gases. And so when you're high up in the atmosphere, those gases are essentially depleted, gone from that parcel of gas. And so that dry parcel of gas then is descending in the belt regions. So you do not expect much of those gases. And in fact, you do see much thinner cloud layers uh, over the belts. So why study Jupiter? Well, what we really are interested in ultimately is how did our solar system form? That's really the fundamental question. And one of the, reason, the, the ways we can think about that and build theories how our solar system might have formed is we first need to know the composition of the bodies in our solar system. Uh, and because that gives us information on the uh, conditions of our solar nebula during the time that the sun and the planets formed. And so that counts for many of the small objects in our solar system, but also for the large planets like Jupiter. Now the composition can be determined either through remote sensing by taking spectra and images, 
or we can just go there and send a probe down into the atmosphere uh, and then analyze the data in situ. And so for Jupiter, we have done both. So observations at different wavelengths uh, will give you uh, information on different altitudes in the atmosphere and also will give you information on the different molecules in the atmosphere. Uh, so for example, uh, when we uh, look at a Hubble Space Telescope image, then we basically see light, sunlight reflected from the clouds, like here. Uh, and so that gives you information on the composition of Jupiter, if you make take spectra, from near the upper cloud layers, the ammonium ice cloud layer and maybe the ammonium hydrosulfide cloud layer. We really cannot look much deeper than those cloud layers because uh, that's the way the, we are confined to the levels where the sunlight is reflected back to us. If we go to uh, somewhat longer wavelengths, in particular here at five micron, we can probe much deeper. Here at five micron, what we see is thermal emission from the planet itself. So it's, it's, it's warm emission, basically black body radiation, uh, and at places where there is not much clouds, that is where the thermal emission can penetrate through, can, can rise up through the atmosphere, and that is what we see. So these bright patterns on here basically are regions where we can probe much deeper in the atmosphere and we see a high temperature. At radio wavelengths, we also see this thermal emission from the planets uh, and here we can actually look a little bit deeper. But before I get back to this one, uh, if you go for, say, mid-infrared wavelengths, 10, 20 micron, then you get information uh, just a little bit above this upper cloud layer. You get information in the so-called upper troposphere and lower stratosphere, so just around the uh, part where there is a minimum in the temperature pressure curve. So you really want to get data at all these different wavelengths to build up a three-dimensional uh, picture of Jupiter itself. So at five micron wavelengths, we typically probe depths of about seven to eight bar deep, which is about 80 kilometers or so below the upper cloud level. So at radio wavelengths, we can probe even deeper. Uh, so the longer the wavelengths, the deeper we can probe. Uh, and uh, for example, here shows a picture um, well, it doesn't give the frequencies here, but if you uh, look at wavelengths around one centimeter uh, or 25 gigahertz, you also probe this cloud region. But if you look at about six centimeter or much deeper, 10 centimeter, uh, then you can probe uh, much, much deeper up to maybe a few hundred bars. So the main source of opacity at radio wavelengths is ammonia gas. And the nice thing is ammonia gas gives you also that upper cloud layer. And ammonia gas is also dissolved into the hydrogen sulfide cloud layer, which actually isn't shown here. I just noticed that now. Um, it's not my picture. So. Um, and, and then we have the, the, uh, the water cloud layer, which also actually takes up a little bit of ammonia gas. So ammonia gas is really pretty crucial if we can find out how ammonia gas is decreasing from deeper levels up through the atmosphere to high altitudes. Uh, we know, uh, we learn quite a lot about, uh, about Jupiter. So we started this already uh, basically decades ago. And at that point, we got spectra like this, uh, which at the time were really very good. Uh, so these spectra goes from about a millimeter, one centimeter, where you see a dip in the uh, spectrum, that is where the ammonia uh, absorbs the most, and then you go to longer wavelengths. Uh, and so you get this, this entire spectrum, and that you can then try to model with radiative transfer models. So you uh, say, okay, suppose my atmosphere consists of solar abundances of all the elements. So ammonia is uh, in the proportion of that is similar to the solar abundance of nitrogen and water, the solar abundance of oxygen. And then you get uh, this sort of dashed curve over here, which doesn't really do a 
very bad job, but you can try to do a little bit better, uh, and you play around with the numbers. But whatever you do, we always found that ammonia was pretty close to the solar value uh, in, in Jupiter's atmosphere. Okay, so then the Galileo probe went into Jupiter's atmosphere. And the Galileo probe measured all these abundances in situ. So they really got very good measurements, albeit in a so-called hot spot, in one of these infrared, really bright spots where we look very deep into the atmosphere and where there are no clouds uh, covering up the emission from below. So here you see a little arrow, and that is where the probe went in uh, on the HST image. So what we found is that Many of these elements, uh, well, argon, krypton, xenon, but also carbon and nitrogen and sulfur, they were all enhanced compared to the solar values by about a factor of four to five. So that's, well, one note I should make here. The solar abundance is changing kind of weekly. So, so the numbers here are now here on this older graph are about three times solar, but I will usually talk about four to five compared to the new solar value. So that is kind of interesting. It shows that the so-called heavy abundances on Jupiter are all enhanced compared to the solar values by this factor of about four to five. But when we look here at water, oxygen, they never really got a good value for oxygen. So oxygen here is way, way down. The water value, the water uh, abundance as measured by the Galileo probe seemed to be even less than half the solar value. And that shows that there is something funny going on. Well, we are in a hot spot, so maybe that has something to do with it. The other thing that is odd is that the radio observations that we took all show that the ammonia abundance is very close to the solar value, but the Galileo probe at lower levels showed us that it is about four to five times solar. So there are these two questions that surface. One, what is the water abundance in Jupiter's deep atmosphere really? And the second is, how can we reconcile these ground-based observations with the Galileo probe data? And so these are two questions that we will address, and I'll start with the first one. So the water abundance, they will give us clues actually on Jupiter's formation. So in 1999, Toby Owen uh, et al. suggested that all the heavy elements were probably acquired in what we call amorphous ice. So, uh, so ice that actually was at such low temperatures, about 30 degree Kelvin, uh, and all the elements were uh, essentially trapped into that ice. And if Jupiter is made of such ice, then the abundances of all these elements, water, as well as ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, etc., are all enhanced by the same amount. So another uh, theory was that, well, maybe these elements, the volatiles, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, etc., were trapped in what we call crystalline ice, uh, we call it in the form of class rate hydrates. It's basically a little water cage, and then uh, these volatiles are trapped inside it. And that happens at temperatures of order 150 Kelvin or so. If that were the case, then the water on Jupiter should be about 10 times or maybe more than the solar value. So if the former is true, maybe Jupiter formed at 30 astronomical units, uh, uh, Neptune, Pluto's orbit, and then migrated inwards. If they were trapped uh, in this crystalline ice, then Jupiter might have formed where it is right now. And so there are many, many theories talking about where Jupiter might have formed, how it might have migrated. Uh, there are just new theories coming up uh, all the time. And one of the uh, things that we hope that Juno might address is what is the water abundance deep down, and uh, once we know that, that may tell us 
something about at least the materials that Jupiter was formed. I won't go as far to say that if its amorphous ice, Jupiter must have migrated in from over 30 astronomical units. We only know then that the materials that formed Jupiter were formed at those distances. Well, the second uh, question is, how can we reconcile the ground-based radio measurements with the probe data? Why do we find about one about uh, ammonia equal to a solar abundance, and why does the probe find these four to five times uh, enhancement? So for that, we use the uh, very large radio telescope. And these are what we call uh, contribution functions. That is the part at which frequency we can look uh, down to certain depths in the atmosphere. So if you look at frequencies of about uh, uh, 25 gigahertz, that is around one centimeter, then we probe the very high altitudes in the atmosphere, that is altitudes near the ammonia ice cloud. So it's not that high, it's still in the troposphere. But if we go to uh, lower frequencies or longer wavelengths out to say um, one and a half gigahertz, which is 20 centimeter, then we can probe down to about a 10 bar level, which is about 100 kilometers below the uh, ammonia ice cloud. So really depending on the wavelengths, we can kind of match where in the atmosphere, how deep do we want to probe. Oh, and then uh, just I show here again the cloud layers, where the cloud layers form, so you get an idea about which wavelengths or frequencies you probe, which kind of cloud layers you're sensitive to. So gas, as I mentioned, is rising in the zones. It's condensing out. Radio observations are mostly sensitive to the ammonia abundance. So if there is less ammonia gas, you probe deeper. If there's more, you probe less deep. But now let's look at the uh, profile that you expect for ammonia gas when you rise up in the atmosphere. So let's look here at this cyan colored uh, line. This has the abundance in the deep atmosphere that was measured by the Galileo probe. When we move up, clouds start to form. We lose a little bit of ammonia gas in the water solution cloud. Then we lose a little more in the ammonium hydrosulfide cloud. And then ammonia condenses out completely into the ammonia ice cloud uh, at the top layer. So this profile we are sensitive to by measuring Jupiter at these different radio wavelengths. A similar profile is shown here for if Jupiter would be just a solar abundance for everything. So there again we have going up at the solar value from deep down and here again you form this NH4SH layer and the ammonia ice cloud. Um. So we have uh, obtained now spectra with the very large array, uh, which are much, much better than the older spectra I showed you. Uh, and what I show here is uh, in these red points are points that we, uh, measurements that we made with the very large array. Uh, they are still preliminary data. They are updated from a science paper that we published uh, a year ago. And on, superposed on these data points, I show the curves, the cyan curve, which is the basically the Galileo probe profile. And I show the blue one, which is basically the solar profile. And then I show just an ad hoc red one, which is, has no physical basis whatsoever. And what you see right away is that indeed the Galileo profile does not match the data at all. The solar profile does do a little bit better, but is also not really quite right. It's something in between. So how can we reconcile that? First, here's a blow up of the, uh, of the uh, spectrum near the uh, bottom of the, of the curve, near the one centimeter. And uh, essentially here you can see uh, that 
the data are really pretty densely sampled. These green data points are from an uh, undergraduate student, Ramsey Karim. He is now finishing up a paper to publish those data together with a bunch of fits to the data. So it's a very nice work. So the ammonia conundrum, how can we reconcile the Galileo probe measurements with the ground-based radio measurements, the ammonia abundance? So we can go sort of think of two ways. Somehow we have to lose that ammonia gas from deep down to high up. But one way is, well, maybe ammonia gas in these different cloud layers will we get we lose a lot more in the in the water cloud layer or the ammonium hydrosulfide cloud layer. So far, we really haven't uh, seen evidence that that might happen. The other thing is dynamics. Maybe you have some of these updrafts. Air is drying out and will just essentially descend all over the planet, and in that way, kind of dry out the planet. So you have updrafts. Clouds form, the air dries out, and you get the dry air descending over a large fraction of the planet. So we want to test those different models by observing at different ways. So we use these two complementary techniques. Uh, we use data, both images, maps, and spectroscopy at five micron. And this is a image at five micron taken with the uh, Keck telescope uh, using adaptive optics, a quite complicated way to get images like that. Some of the things you can see here, in fact, are these very bright spots. These are the so-called hot spots, one of which was similar to where the Galileo probe entered Jupiter. And the other one is the maps of at radio wavelengths, yeah? And, and so those hot spots correspond to a belt, is that correct? Uh, they uh, well, they are hot spots in a belt. And yeah, I'll get back to that also when I show some, some radio data, but yeah. Um, so we have uh, made more observations at these images at, at five micron wavelengths. Uh, and I show some here because they, well, they're gorgeous. Uh, but also you can learn quite a lot from it. Uh, so here, for example, we see the great red spot and oval uh, BA. That was an oval. I don't know, some of you may remember that there used to be three of these big white ovals just south of the great red spot. And over a, a period of uh, a few years, they just merged together and they are now known as uh, oval BA, in fact, red oval BA. Uh, but you can see at 5 micron that the great red spot is indeed completely dark. There's no emission coming through that storm system. They're so, the clouds are so thick that you do not get any of that thermal emission coming through that vortex or storm system. And the same with that oval BA. Uh, this one shows a superposition. Uh, these are all uh, near-infrared wavelengths where we see the um, uh, sunlight reflected from uh, Jupiter. Uh, but then uh, this one gives you the thermal emission from the planet itself. And you can see that the thermal emission is sort of going around these different vortices. And in this image, you can show that, see that even better. There are a lot of smaller storm systems, vortices, and they all seem to just have a dark core at five micron and then this very bright ring around it. So that means that at the center we cannot really look into this cloud system at five micron, but around the edges we can look pretty deep and see these high temperatures. Uh, and here are some more superpositions uh, of this five micron data showing indeed that they are very nicely uh, fit around these vortices. So that led us to come up with the idea that probably, most likely, you get gases rising up in these storm systems, drying out, and then uh, at the edge of these storm systems, the dry air descends down in the atmosphere, and that really makes these bright rings around the vortex uh, where the air is dry so you can probe much deeper, meaning the thermal emission can just rise uh, and leak out from the system at those locations. 
the great red spot is different. Uh, we think that the great red spot at the center actually has gas that is going down and around the center you have the gas rising up. So it's a very, very different system. It's much, much bigger, uh, and that is probably one of the reasons that it is so different. Uh, but so there we have a very different dynamic pattern than for the smaller vortices. So we learn a whole lot more by also doing spectroscopy, and it took quite a while before we were finally able actually to do that. So we use the Keck telescope to take spectra which have a very high spectral resolution. So this spectral resolution is much higher than the spectral resolution that the Juno spacecraft at five micron with the YIRAM instrument provides us. So this is a complicated plot, I know that, but Linda told me that's fine, show graphs, <laughs> because the audience loves graphs. Uh, so, so let me try to step you through this. So these are spectra uh, at two different locations on Jupiter. One uh, is a zone, pretty, uh, uh, so that is this curve uh, block A, and that those are the upper uh, sort of spectra. And the other one is B, and that is right in a hot spot, and that is a, the, the bottom one. Also, the, the um, uh, radiances of these different ones are different. But what is most intriguing here is when we first look at this upper one, which is at a zone, we see a lot of relatively narrow spectral lines. We see deuterated methane, uh, many of those deuterated methane lines. We see, uh, we don't see water here much, but the lines are narrow. And what that tells us is that we probe levels in the atmosphere that are pretty high up in the atmosphere. Because these lines are all what we call pressure broadened. Uh, due to collisions with gases in the atmosphere, the lines just get pressure broadened. And so the broader the line is, the origin then is deeper in the atmosphere. So for these relatively narrow lines, the origin is pretty high up, and we model that uh, and we show here different uh, curves, but the curve that really fits these data show that the emission originates from depths of about four bar. So what cloud could that be? So then we think back about the early pictures I showed, which are the different cloud layers, and we notice that the four bar must be a water cloud. And that's already interesting, because that is one of the first times we actually see a water cloud in Jupiter. And in fact, we only see the top of the water cloud, so we do not know how deep this water cloud extends. And that tells us also that we don't know how much water is in the atmosphere. We do know, however, that it must be at least 1.2 times the solar oxygen value. And, uh, that is already more than, about three times more than the Galileo probe measured, yeah? Uh, could, you, could you explain the uh, technique of actually uh, getting these uh, spectro spectrographs? Because you know, it's a very small planet in terms of uh, arc seconds of space, and it's actually looking at just a tiny spot on the Yeah. Planet. Is that right? Right, so we have, we have uh, so, so it basically I won't go into much detail, but it's basically slit, uh, slit spectroscopy. Uh, these are the slits, actually there are two uh, different ways we have superposed them, because Jupiter is about 40 arc seconds, uh, and the slits are about, uh, I think it's 27 arc seconds. Okay. Uh, and then you get a spectrum at each point along the slits. And with the seeing of about half an arc seconds, you get pretty good spatial resolution on Jupiter. That tells it in a nutshell. Uh, so, uh, so, so we, we now know that there are widespread water clouds under at least the zonal regions on Jupiter, uh, which tells us that indeed the idea of gas rising up in the atmosphere in the zones is, is a good theory. So the other one, in the hot spot, we see very, very broad spectral lines. I mean, they really already blend together, and that tells us that we probe 
levels in the atmosphere at least about seven bar deep, well below where we might expect a water cloud. So there are just no clouds in the hot spots. And in fact, the Galileo probe had not seen any clouds there either. So it's not a surprise. Uh, but uh, these spectra can really help us determine how much, what the composition is of the gases, how much there is of each of these gases in the atmosphere. So these uh, five micron imaging and spectroscopy tell us uh, that um, in the hot regions and uh, the five micron rings, we really do probe down to about five to seven bar. We have this picture of rising gas and descending right around these uh, storm systems. And then hotspots, belts, and high latitude regions do exhibit these broad deuterated methane line profiles because they collide uh, with a lot of uh, hydrogen, uh, about seven to eight bars of hydrogen gas, and that indicates us that there are no opaque water clouds. Uh, so the zones then exhibit these narrow profiles, and that tells us uh, that there must be a water cloud at about the four to five bar level. So we learned already quite a lot, and, and of course we, we have a lot more data that, that we can, uh, can analyze and are analyzing. But I switch now to the radio part, which is very complementary to the 5 micron spectroscopy. So the radio data, we used the uh, very large array after it had been upgraded. That means the sensitivity increased by a factor of 10. So we now can do things with the very large array that we never before were able to do. So we probe different levels in the atmosphere. And uh, when you take the images, take the data, and you treat them as we have treated them over decades, you basically get these what we call longitude smeared images. And so this is an image of Jupiter smeared in longitude because you have to build up the signal to noise and we subtracted in fact a uniform limb darkened disk so you can really see all these belts and zones very very well so these are at the bright regions we see the uh, thermal emission uh, from Jupiter's atmosphere deep down where the temperature is high and in the darker regions uh, we probe much higher in the atmospheres and that is typically in the zonal regions. All the way around it you actually see a glow of Jupiter's non-thermal or synchrotron radiation emitted by high energy electrons trapped in Jupiter's magnetic field. Wow. That was actually, I've done a lot of work on that during my thesis work, <laughs> but, but I, I'm not going to talk about that here. Uh, what I'm, uh, the next thing I show you here are at all these different frequencies from about 3 gigahertz up to 25, we take north-south scans through the planet and that is shown over here. So uh, what we see is a north-south scan, we see the temperature, the brightness temperature that we measure at about 25 gigahertz, and you can see that there are some peaks, and that, of course, are these bright belts. Uh, and then we see this very, very bright one up here, and we see that same belt at all these different frequencies, going down all the way to 3 gigahertz, uh, which is about um, uh, uh, 10 centimeters. So that's, that is really intriguing. Uh, when we plot this or show this in a different way, when we stack all of these uh, things on top of each other, uh, we can make kind of an image like here where the image uh, in this direction is the latitude from about minus 80 to plus 80 degrees in, lat in, in longitude, I mean, no latitude. Uh, and in this direction, it's the frequency. So you can see here very nicely this very bright belt, bright at all these different frequencies. Uh, and here we see a dark one, which is the equatorial zone right next to it. And so by, by using data like that, and then modeling it with uh, radiative transfer models, we can really determine what the ammonia distribution is in Jupiter's atmosphere. So I show, again, a graph. Uh, and uh, this graph shows uh, the data 
along the equatorial zone, so that was this dark region here, and the other one, the red one, is through the equatorial uh, belt, and now as a function of frequency. Uh, so this is the brightness temperature as a function of frequency, and the lines then are models superposed on the data to get an idea how much ammonia is present in those zones versus belts. And you can see already this is much, much brighter uh, than, the, uh, than the zone, and these are then the ammonia profiles that match those data, at least uh, mostly. Uh, so this bottom one shows that the data are pretty well matched by this so-called Galileo Pro profile. So you have a lot of ammonia deep down and you just let it rise up, some ammonia is condensing out, and that fits those data perfectly. We've never before seen that, but now with the higher spatial resolution uh, of the very large array, we actually can see that. And the top one, this uh, North Equatorial Belt, uh, fits, doesn't fit that data at all. Uh, it actually shows you that maybe deep down you have uh, as much ammonia gas as the probe indicated, but then you d definitely get a decrease in the ammonia abundance uh, down to about two times the solar value, and then at high altitudes, you again really deplete the ammonia considerably, otherwise you cannot get this, uh, these points much higher up than in the zone. So doing, not really an inversion, but trying to match the data with models at all these different um, uh, latitudes and uh, and using all these spectra, uh, we get a picture of the ammonia abundance shown over here. So this goes uh, with pressure, so deep down, 10 bar. We cannot really, we are not sensitive to much deeper than that. At 10 bar, you say, okay, we use whatever the probe measured, and we assume that that measurement is what the ammonia abundance is deep down. And then when you go to higher uh, levels, lower pressures, we see that the ammonia is decreasing, and for example here uh, it decreases, uh, no here, here it's still high in the equatorial zone, uh, up to the probe level, uh, you get a decrease here, which is where we form this ammonia hydrosulfide cloud, and of course at the higher levels you get a decrease where you form the ammonia ice cloud. But then right next to it, this north equatorial belt, the ammonia is really depleted considerably down to considerable depths. So these are the type of, uh, of measurements we can then make uh, and, and interpret, and that gives us an idea about gases rising and sinking in zones versus belts. Now, of course we want more. Now with the improved very large array, we can do much better, and we basically take the data and we take out Jupiter's rotation. So basically we derotate the planet. And I don't go into the details of how we do that. But for example, uh, you can uh, think about having a cross on your sphere and then when you look at it from a different direction, it looks differently. But you can basically manipulate the data geometrically such that uh, a cross, even if it walks around the planet, is uh, a cross at the center of the planet. So the great red spot could just be, if you take out the rotation of the planet, you can make the great red spot as if you see that face on all the time. So we have done that uh, many years ago uh, with these data from uh, 1996, which at the time were the best data we had. And already at that time, we noticed that in the radio we have these hot spots, which agree perfectly well with what was seen at five micron wavelengths. So we already knew that in the radio we see the same hot spots as at five micron wavelengths. However, now what we see are images like these. So I have here an amateur image at visible wavelengths, the colored one, uh, and that is from Marco Virovato, uh, and then a superposed switching on and off 
is a radio image at two centimeter or 12 to 18 gigahertz. So this is interesting and this is something we could just look at for, for hours. Uh, you can, uh, so, so we see in the radio, we see these really bright hot spots and we can now really pinpoint them. We can just look at one of those and we see that those hot spots really coincide with these darker gray regions in the visible. So it's, it's, it's really uh, quite remarkable. And in the radio, we, we had never seen that before. Uh, we call that a, a radio hot belt, which is right at the interface of the North Equatorial Belt and the Equatorial Zone. We also see here the great red spot, dark at the center, meaning that we do not probe very deep into it. Uh, there is uh, a lot of ammonia gas there, so we cannot probe deep into it. Whereas around it, as in the, uh, as in the hot spots, there's much less ammonia gas, so we probe deeper, warmer layers. Up here is an image at about one centimeter, uh, or 20 gigahertz, which is right near the uh, dip in the, in the spectrum. Uh, so this is very, very sensitive to the amount of ammonia gas. And here, this was taken at a different time. Here we can see the great red spot over here. Again, very bright, not much ammonia gas at the south, south side. And you can see all the turbulence. You can see the hot spots, etc. Well, but really, and, and when you look careful, you see all these little, tiny, little ovals, etc. You really see just what HST is seeing which is just remarkable. I mean, it, it blew us away when we saw that the first time. At six centimeter, about five gigahertz, it's very different. You just don't see these vortices. You don't see many small features, which tells us that you basically don't see as much weather when you go a little bit deeper into Jupiter's atmosphere. What we do see is we still see this radio hot belt, which consists of these hot spots, and we see these really dark ovals, very nicely spaced, like a wave pattern. You still can see the great red spot. So that wave pattern is, is very intriguing, and we think it is essentially the counterpart of these hot spots, and I get back to that in, in just a little bit. Uh, this is an image at 10 gigahertz uh, at uh, X-band, and here we do see the same thing. We see this radio hot belt with the hot spots, and we see also these, this dark pattern uh, of, of ovals. And again, this was taken at the same time as these data and these visible data, uh, but at a different time from the uh, six centimeter data. So now let's see what the ammonia abundance in those uh, different regions are. Uh, so these are, again, graphs, just like the other one. Uh, but now we show what the ammonia abundance is in these hot spots and in these dark ovals that we call plumes. So in the plumes, we see that they really do match, again, this Galileo profile very, very well. So we think in these dark ovals that we get gas rising up, of course, then condensing out because the temperature is decreasing, but you really get these plumes of ammonia gas rising up through the atmosphere. In these hot spots, we do not have much ammonia gas, and that is given by this line over here. There's just not much ammonia gas, and we can probe really deep. And so that then together tells us that indeed we probably do see the counterpart of the hot spots in these plumes. And so you get plumes and hot spots, uh, and that at the time was surmised that the hot spots were part of, uh, of a, a Rossby wave uh, that um, at the time was inferred by, for example, um, uh, Adam Schoeman and Tim Dowling, where you have hot spots interspersed with dark spots, plumes, 
uh, and that wave then might explain what we dynamically what we're seeing here. And indeed, from data that we took in uh, December of 2013 and two weeks later, we can derive what the speed of these plumes is, and it is just exactly the same speed as the speed that at infrared wavelengths people have uh, derived um, for the hot spots. So that then tells us in a summary for the radio that we see these large variations in the ammonia abundance across the disk. We see these vortices, small scale turbulence features. Uh, basically we really see a very highly dynamic planet at pressure levels less than about two to three bars. Just the top two cloud layers only and not really much deeper. We see this radio hot belt descending dry air and the hot spots and they go much deeper than eight or ten bar. But we cannot really pin down from our data how deep it goes. Uh, we talked about the Rossby wave explaining plumes and hot spots uh, and, and basically we can now say that this conundrum between the Galileo data and the radio data is caused by atmospheric dynamics. It's really in the plume regions, you just have these plumes of ammonia gas coming up and basically drying out while rising, condensing out, and then descending over the rest of the planet, drying out the upper atmosphere. And then if you look at a uh, disk average image, radio wavelengths, for Jupiter, you just find that the ammonia abundance is similar to the solar value at these higher levels, but indeed can be as much as what Galileo probe measured deeper down. So that is basically written out here. So the next thing is the Juno mission. And you all have probably read in the newspapers what this mission is. It will now probably continue until September 2019. Uh, passing uh, by Jupiter in a very uh, elliptical, eccentric orbit. Uh, and basically the key goals for that mission are to um, map the gravity field to find out what the core really uh, is composed of and, and how big it is. Uh, but also the gravity maps will tell us a little bit about the flows in the, uh, the, the winds, zonal winds, uh, in Jupiter's atmosphere. And then there is a microwave radiometer that will look deeper down into the atmosphere and they study the aurora. So this is uh, just a, an image or a graph of Jupiter with its magnetic field, uh, and in fact very close to the field, to, uh, to Jupiter, uh, you will see this, this, this uh, energetic emission from electrons that are trapped in Jupiter's magnetic field. Uh, this shows you both the thermal emission and then all the way around it, you see that synchrotron radiation, which I won't talk about. Uh, the other thing is the aurora uh, high up in the atmosphere. These are images with the Hubble Space Telescope. And so the Juno spacecraft is flying through the, over the pole, really get a very good view of the pole itself, of course at the visible, but also infrared wavelengths, and also measuring the particles uh, moving, presumably up and down from the aurora, down into the magnetosphere and maybe in some cases connecting uh, the food points of, uh, of EO and Ganymede and Europa. So it really goes over the pole and then it comes very close to Jupiter between the radiation belts and the atmosphere to observe Jup uh, Jupiter itself at different wavelengths and then moving back out again. So this is one of the uh, images, uh, and all these images were taken by the Juno cam, uh, the outreach camera, and then processed by different amateur astronomers. And so this is one of the images really showing the polar region here uh, and the um, areas around it. And you can see from this that there is a large uh, variation in what you see near the pole, all these kind of cyclone uh, cyclones in the atmosphere, and then you see these uh, other bands around it closer to the equator. 
And then, of course, this past uh, few days, it went over the great red spot, and this is one of the images that I grabbed from the, from the web. Uh, what, what, what sort of strikes me here, but maybe, maybe I'm just fantasizing, but what strikes me here is you see this core, and you see this stuff around it, and to me, it looks like the idea that really you have air kind of going down at the center of, of the great red spot and rising up, uh, around it in a donut, that that may indeed be the right picture to think about uh, for this great red spot. So the deep atmosphere is sensed uh, at the radio wavelengths by the microwave radiometer, uh, and they go down to about uh, 50 centimeter wavelengths, which probes depths in the atmosphere about 10 times deeper than we can do with the very large array. So their goal also is to determine the 3D uh, ammonia abundance, but also the water abundance. And I, I can tell you that that is very, very difficult because the water does absorb some at radio wavelengths, but it's a tiny, tiny fraction compared to the absorption by ammonia gas. So that will be an incredibly tough and difficult measurement. But if, if anyone can do it, then the Juno spacecraft can do it. So Juno's field of view is tiny. So this shows the uh, field of view of uh, at one centimeter and 50 centimeter going, well, basically with respect to the, uh, to the great red spot. So they, they, they move over Jupiter. They have this tiny, tiny beam, and that is where they get their microwave measurements. They don't know without context images what they're looking at. So they can measure a lot of ammonia gas, not much, but they don't know what it relates to. They know the longitude and the latitude, but as you could see on the early images, all these features on Jupiter move all the time. So you really do need simultaneous measurements at some wavelengths. And of course, the best wavelengths to do that at is the radio wavelengths using the very large array. Well, we don't get that much time on a very large array, but we do get some, and indeed we do have some simultaneous measurements uh, of the very large array and with the Juno spacecraft. And the nice thing then is that we get these two-dimensional maps at different frequencies, and Juno will get it along one line of uh, one one track, and then along that track you can extend the very large array data down to much deeper depths uh, and, and do a really detailed investigation of the atmosphere. So Mike Jensen uh, is the uh, PI of the microwave radiometer, uh, and he showed at uh, the, during the AGU talk in December uh, sort of similar curves as I showed you before, uh, where uh, these different curves show the... Um, uh, this side uh, shows the, um, uh, the temperature uh, in Kelvin going from 150 down to 1,000, and then here the depths below the cloud deck. So at these upper curves, uh, we see a cyan and a black one, and that is from the first and the third orbit that the uh, Juno spacecraft did. And you can see that there are differences between the cyan and the black one uh, at at least... Uh, the, uh, what is it, this is the, uh, this is the one centimeter and uh, the, the two centimeter curves up to three centimeter, you see a lot of differences, which is just like what we showed with the very large array data. It is the region where you probe the upper cloud layers, which we showed is very, very dynamic. You, we see all these little vortices, etc., and that, of course, then gives rise to the differences that they see in their brightness temperature when they fly over Jupiter, not really knowing where they're probing at that time. And then when you go to deeper levels, uh, to the 6 and the, the uh, 15 and the 50 centimeter, you really see that those two curves are pretty much on top of each other, meaning that at those deep levels, there's not much dynamics going on, but you still get uh, large differences between the belts and the zones, this so-called radio hot belt. Uh, and a similar one is showed here, uh, together with the data that we had taken with the very large array. And you can see that really there, 
is a lot of um, uh, synergy between uh, those data sets. So they also derived a two-dimensional uh, two distribution for the ammonia gas along one of their tracks, uh, and this is their picture compared to what we had shown before. This is going from minus to plus 40, and this is going to from minus to plus 80 or so. So what is most intriguing here is, first of all, there's a lot of similarity. We see a lot of ammonia gas near the equator, and not much at this north equatorial belt next to it, which is to be expected. The measurement that they made deeper down is much less ammonia gas than the uh, Galileo probe measured. And so these are the data from the Galileo probe. Uh, this again is the ammonia abundance. This is data from the Galileo probe. And this red one is what the Juno spacecraft has measured. And so we don't know what the difference is. We don't really understand that. And the other thing that we don't understand, although I have some idea what it might be caused by, is they see a lot down here and when you go up, and then they see a minimum in ammonia gas near the about five bar level, and then it goes up again. Well, if you think about clouds or air rising up through the atmosphere, clouds condense out, the dry air is descending from above, you can never ever get suddenly an increase with altitude again. The only way I can see how to reconcile that is if you have horizontal motions, if you have a horizontal motion from um, the, let's see, from, now I have to think hard. Uh, <laughs> if you have a horizontal motion uh, bringing uh, cloud uh, ammonia, cloud particles down from the equatorial zone, horizontally bringing it over to uh, neighboring regions, and that is where air was descending down, then that descending air will take the ammonia ice cloud particles down with them where they will evaporate. And that may cause this higher ammonia abundance, because that is where the ammonia is evaporating too hot to be still condensed. So that's the only way I can see that you could explain these data, but I haven't read anything uh, if there are theories uh, made up by the team yet or not. So, so basically the ground-based campaign then to support Juno is of course, our radio data, where we get these uh, radio maps compared to the Juno tracks, and so we can extend the VLA data to deeper levels using the Juno data or the Juno data. You can put those in context with uh, the larger scale picture at radio wavelengths. There's a dedicated network of amateur astronomers, and some of you may, uh, may indeed participate in that. So there are many, many people uh, all over the world observing Jupiter, preferably near the time of these Juno encounters, and then by really putting all this data together over all these different wavelengths, can we really try to get a coherent picture of this planet uh, and interpret the data and really get a good idea of what Jupiter is made of. And just here are some uh, teasers uh, that we uh, did uh, simultaneously in, in early January. Actually, there was no, um, no Juno encounter there because they had changed their orbits. But meanwhile, we did get HST data and at the same time Gemini data at 5 micron. And you can see just, I mean, gorgeous images. Uh, we have many, many more, uh, but we, we actually need people to help analyze them. And I guess that's where I will end. Yeah. So uh, you said 15% helium, 85% hydrogen. Is that for just the gas portion? And what is it that we know about uh, a solid core? Is there one? So we, we don't know uh, we don't know much about the core yet. So there there have been 
uh, gravity measurements with the Juno spacecraft, and the only thing I've read is that they think the core is a little more diluted, uh, larger than they had thought before. But they, they never really knew if the core was solid and how small or large it is. So they hope by putting a lot of these Juno orbits together, get a really good um, measurement of the gravity field that ultimately they may be able to, de to determine that. It, it's, it's difficult because you, um, um, you have measurements that pertain to the core, but also to the mantle and to flows in in Jupiter that all affect these measurements. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult measurement to, to ultimately make. So we, we are not certain that there's a core at all? Uh, we, we're pretty certain that the density is higher at the center than in the mantle, and you can call that a core. Yeah? First of all, the next time I look at Jupiter, I'm going to see so much more. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Also, from what I've been reading lately, in terms of things outside our solar system, people who study massive gas giant planets and brown dwarfs and tiny stars are arguing about who gets to name these different objects. You know, it seems like there's some overlap. And I don't know if you've been following that other work or not. But in terms of distinguishing between gas giant planets and brown dwarfs and tiny stars, how, where do you fall? Well, the, I mean, it depends on the mass of the object, right? So, so once they know the mass, then they know if it's a giant planet or a brown dwarf or a star. Um, so, so, so they have to find out what the mass of the planet is. Um, so, I don't know <laughs> what else I can say. Okay. I mean, what, is, what, is, what becomes harder, I think, is once they can get real spectra and try to determine what the composition is from spectra. Because as you have now seen today, uh, we can get spectra of, of Jupiter. The early spectra in the radio showed compositions that were not right. I mean, you, you really have to be able to probe below cloud layers. So if you have clouds in these exoplanets, you have to get below that. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us the uh, relationship of uh, temperature to pressure? Yeah. That, uh, that is, as you go down to the higher a uh, higher bar, higher pressure, how does the temperature change? So the temperature is, is, is uh, increasing when you go down with depths, and it's basically just an adiabat, uh, adiabatically increasing. Um, so you uh, yeah, can just make the calculations uh, how the temperature is varying with pressure in the atmosphere, and that is how we do the calculations. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of details that we would like to understand uh, because there are, of course, some horizontal variations in temperature, uh, but it's, it's very hard to actually measure that. So there's, there, there's, there's still a, a lot of research that is going on to try to really connect everything, all the data that you get at the different wavelengths, but then also with the theory and with, for example, how the, the winds, the zonal winds flow on Jupiter at different levels. Uh, and that is something that is really not at all understood yet. Yeah. One of the pictures you showed suggested that the gas in the red spot was descending towards the surface of the planet. Yeah. And, and, and I guess that's why they call it an anti-cyclone. But in a cyclone, it is stable because there's circulation around it, and the centrifugal force holds the rest of the atmosphere out. So in a cyclone, you can have a, a hole down into the atmosphere. But what stabilizes the, the high pressure 
cylinder that must be descending in the red spot? Um, so, so it, it's the uh, the anti-cyclones uh, that I'm trying to find the images here, uh, where yeah. Uh, so uh, the anti-cyclones, uh, where we uh, think that. So those are those are like the the white storms. Those are confined. Uh, storm systems and the cyclones are much more spread out. So the cyclones uh, are um, up. Uh, I don't know if you. Well, they're they're typical. Oh, if I go one further. Uh, so these up here are mostly cyclones, uh, and so they are much more vague than the anticyclones. The anticyclones, you indeed have the uh, uh, the pressure and the different forces uh, that balance each other. And um, so we, uh, for example, here we have, we show in the uh, high pressure uh, in the anticyclone, and that high pressure is sort of pushing uh, gases up uh, to the higher levels, and then you get the condensation and you get the descent around it. And so in, in the great red spot, we think that uh, you still have a higher pressure deeper down, and you get uh, material rising, but then in sort of a donut around the center, and then we get a descent in the center. And so there are measurements uh, at mid-infrared wavelengths by other people that also indicate that you probably have a uh, downwelling uh, in the center of the great red spot, whereas around it uh, you have upwelling. Is there any formation like that in the Earth's atmosphere? Um, well, in the Earth's atmosphere, you have the hurricanes, which um, are different than than what we see here. It's sort of the opposite. Yeah, the opposite. Yeah, right. So it's it's more the opposite there. We we do see uh, hurricanes, for example, at uh, Saturn's uh, south pole. So there we have a, a, a giant, what you think, hurricane. Uh, where, uh, which is very similar to the hurricanes that we see on the Earth. Yeah? Um, I'm a real mom, so I'm just a piece of everything together from college four years ago. Uh, so, with the measurements for gravitational waves, is one of the uh, assessments of the core So, yeah. So, so when you when you go deeper down in Jupiter, uh, the pressure increases uh, dramatically when you go really deep down, uh, and that is indeed where uh, well we call it uh, a liquid um, uh, or metallic hydrogen region, where, where really um, the uh, material is so pressed together that the electrons become kind of um, separate from. Uh, from the protons and, and like yeah, like a plasma, and and so that is where the conductivity then becomes very high, and and that is where we think that the magnetic field is uh, is produced. Uh, so 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 indeed that that's that's where I mean you have basically the the normal physics at work. Is there a similar is there a similar striation in terms of the and granted, it's on such a different level, but on the sun itself, where there's, uh, say, at its horizon, it's hotter than if there's such a thing as a pole, or there's no way of measuring that. 
Well, in, in, in the sun, you, you, you basically you uh, produce a lot of energy uh, down in, in the core, right? And so that, that, those photons just work their way out. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's different in a way. Um, but but uh, if you go to the outer layers, there, of course, you do have the temperature decreasing with altitudes. Uh, but the layers where you have radiation versus convection, etc., that that is all a little bit different. And you, you have to calculate what what is the dominant uh, mechanism for energy transport, basically. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Um, when you descend down from the highest clouds and get to a pressure of, say, uh, one bar, which is equivalent to the hundred surface, uh, what would the uh, temperature be there? And uh, at, at what density are we talking about at one bar? So at one bar, that would be the same density sort of as, as, as here. I mean, it's the same pressure level. Uh, so... Um, uh, and, and, but then on, on Jupiter, the temperature at one bar is of order 140, 150 Kelvin. About 140, 150 Kelvin. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but, but, but that order, yeah. So it would be at a temperature where, uh, say, a balloon could float. Yeah. Uh, uh, without being uh, at, a, at a temperature similar to on the Earth's surface? No, so the temperature is much much lower, right? So so the yeah the, the temperature on uh, well it's about half. <laughs> well, uh, how in, in in Kelvin? So the temperature on on the Earth is about 300 Kelvin, and on Jupiter it's about 150 Kelvin. So it it it's it's well below freezing. I mean, it, so that that's why we cannot see the water up at those levels in Jupiter's atmosphere because the water has already all been frozen out way, way deeper in the atmosphere. Mm. Yeah? When uh, Juno went into orbit around Jupiter, um, I imagine they'd have to know what the gravity pull was of Jupiter in order to go into orbit. Mm -hmm. How do they know that? How do they calculate just... Because I thought that was an amazing thing for Jupiter to catch Juno like that. Yeah, well, they know... Yeah. They know how much gravity Jupiter have in order to calculate that? Well, the, uh, so, so one, basically you need to know the mass of Jupiter, and, and that is, they know that already for hundreds of years, because the, uh, from, from just the orbital motion of the satellites, uh, you can determine what the mass of Jupiter is, uh, so uh, so-called Kepler's laws. Uh, so they, they know that, uh, and they already also knew more about the gravity field from the previous encounters that they have had. Uh, so they could do, well, they, they apparently did a really good job in calculating how uh, to slow down Juno so it would actually be caught uh, and not crash into Jupiter. Well, I thought that was the most amazing astronomical thing that we've ever done is to, to, to do that. Oh. Something, you know, five, you know, it was amazing. Just, was really yeah, no, it was really amazing. Yeah, yeah. We'll look at the information that we see in the coming years with much more background. Thanks to your talk. Yeah. We wish to thank you. Give a certificate of our thanks. <laughs>